as well as our um, hospice brochure. I just want to make sure you all have Over that here, reference. Doug. Yes. And did you get the tall sheet is as well? What this is? I mean, is that okay? Or she'll lean back. Uh, she'll lean back. He's got those right there. She needs these up front. I, yeah, one of each who flew through. You don't want to volunteer? I understanding that this is the first time you guys are gathering as a group, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, we have a lot of programs in the community that get together, especially for caregivers, because your all's job is very hard. Um, and wanting to be able to take care of your family members, friends, um, people that you love in the community. So my name is Justine Waddell. I am the community liaison for Blue Ridge Hospice. A large part of my job is to be able to go out into our community and educate our community, <coughs> hospitals, physicians, um, assisted living facilities, skilled nursing facilities, nursing homes, about what hospice is, what we do, and how we do it. And we have a new program that Anastasia has been doing about a year mm -hmm. um, for our palliative care program. So we're really trying to educate the community the difference between what palliative care is and what hospice is. So and I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay. Well, as you said, I'm Anastasia Mormon, nurse practitioner. I know some of you. I've met some of you. Um, <coughs> Anyhow, so uh, I'm here today. I don't really do the hospice side of anything. Um, I am palliative care nurse practitioner. So Dr. Flynn usually does this talk about the difference between palliative care and hospice. So I need my little cheat sheet here. So forgive me on that one. But um, so today the objectives I just kind of want to just focus on what's it, what is hospice and the common myths with hospice. Uh, what is palliative care? Uh, when is the best time to consider that level of care, and is it ever too soon? And how do I have a conversation with loved ones about this type of care? And then what to expect with hospice or palliative care support, and what is the difference between them? So common myths with hospice, you know, uh, we also we often think that hospice is, my loved one's dying tomorrow, that's why I need hospice, and that, that is the furthest from the case. Um, Hospice is not just for people who have days away uh, from, from passing. Generally, we can have someone on hospice for a year sometimes. Um, generally, we start an individual on hospice when they have six months or less to live. Um, <coughs> another myth is that, oh, once we start hospice, I can't take any more med medications anymore. That is not true at all. You can continue taking all your medications that you take. So if you're in hospice for congestive heart failure, you're going to be taking your heart medicine, um, situations like that. Um, another myth is I get on hospice and they're just going to put me on morphine. That is not the case. Um, we, we, uh, we don't start you on, on, on morphine as soon as you get admitted into hospice. Um, and we treat the symptoms. Uh, we don't focus on a curative treatment anymore. Our main focus is on uh, improving the quality of life. Um, Stacy said it wonderfully. It's not uh, focusing on quantity of life anymore. It's now focusing on the quality of life. Um, hospice is a place you go to, and that is, uh, hospice comes to you. You don't go to hospice. You don't have to go anywhere. <coughs> Um, and that you get care in the home. Uh, hospice uh, takes over and you can't see your doctor anymore. That is not the truth. You can continue seeing your doctor uh, while you are in hospice. And some physicians prefer to be managing the hospice care, and that is perfectly fine. And then um, hospice won't let you go to the hospital, and that is furthest from the truth as well. So. We, many times, um, I do take call one night a week for hospice, and uh, many times I'm saying, let's send them to the hospital. We need to send them out because something else is going on. Um, and so just, I wanted to dispel some of those myths about hospice. Do you all have any questions? I really do want this to be interactive. I want you to ask as we go along anything that we're speaking about. If you have a question right there in that moment, Please stop us so that we can have a conversation about what, what it is we're, we're discussing. Anything so far? So I might add that not only will you come 
into the home, but you'll also come into uh, health care facilities if they're in uh, Spring Arbor, Willows, Heritage Hall, wherever it might be, yep. you're going in there as well. Yes, we have a contract. My um, area that I cover is the Winchester, Frederick, and Clark County. Um, and we have a contract with all the facilities in that area, and all the facilities utilize us as their hospice um, of choice. So we are in several of them, and I would say about 48% of the population that we serve for hospice patients is in a facility. Um, not only do we go to facilities, we also will go to wherever they call home. If that's a camper out in someone's yard, that's where we go. We go wherever you are. We will meet you wherever you are. Um, a lot of people don't realize that. Um, a lot of people also don't understand the fact that um, we take charity care. If, if you need hospice, um, we will not turn you away just because you do not have the ability to pay. So we take everyone. Um, and we will utilize, I'm sure many of you all know our thrift stores. Mm -hmm. So we utilize our thrift store's income to be able to help support patients who can't afford care. So if you're ever donating or shopping, we thank you yeah. tremendously. Yep. Um, so that's a great question. So yeah, we do have a lot of patients all around in different facilities, and we even have Blue Ridge Hospice in the hospital, Winchester Medical Center. Um, so we have staff there. Um, what's nice about hospice, especially with Blue Ridge Hospice, is that they have a large interdisciplinary team. So they have the physicians, nurse practitioners, they have RNs, they have CNAs, they have chaplains, uh, music therapists, uh, social workers, uh, volunteers, a huge volunteer. So you have this whole robust team that's following you with hospice. That's really nice because everybody is working together, rowing in the same direction with a focus on the patient and their quality of life. Um, As well as animal therapy? We do. Yeah, that's right. Pet therapy, therapy that. is mm -hmm. part of our volunteer mm -hmm. program. Yep. Yep. And so I passed around a brochure for you guys, um, and our volunteer program is uh, very robust. I mean, it, it could be anywhere from administrative work, pet therapist. Um, we have people who are just go and sit with, at the bedside with patients. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities. But yeah, pet therapy is one of them. And I, if you've never seen pet therapy in action, it is absolutely amazing. Um, I, for, I don't know how, but those animals know exactly who needs that attention at that moment, and they know exactly how to behave with that patient. It is very, very impressive to watch. Yep. Could um, you spend just a minute and talk about respite care that Blue Ridge Hospice Yep, I'll get there. Okay. Yep, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Um, so, you know, with hospice, again, I keep, I keep saying quality of life, not quantity of life. Um, and so the, the focus is not only on medical uh, symptom management, but we also, the nurses are wonderful. They'll come out and have, give education, uh, wound care, emotional support, spiritual support, you know, all those things that um, when someone is on hospice, you're encompassing the whole family. You're encompassing not only the patient, but the entire family. And, uh, and so that's what's really nice about having this interdisciplinary team. Um, with Blue Ridge Hospice, uh, they are available 24-7. So, like I said, I'm on call one night a week, uh, getting calls all throughout the night with, for patients and their needs um, so that we're able to respond quickly. We have nurses that will go out to the, to the homes, to the nursing homes, wherever that is, to assist if there's something uh, going on. And that's a completely separate team. That's not any of our nurses picking up extra shifts. Uh, we have a complete separate team that is on call. They go on at 4.30 in the afternoon when um, the day personnel for nurses, they go home. Mm -hmm. So and it, it, we, we have a supervisor and we have <coughs> several nurses um, that do that triage throughout the night. Um, so, thank you for mentioning the respite care. So we do have an inpatient care center. Um, it's in the old <coughs> hospital on Cork Street. And it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful um, building. Um, I mean, you just walk in, you can just feel the peace. You can just feel this comfort and the peace. Uh, they have around-the-clock nursing care, uh, RNs, as well as CNAs. Uh, the providers, nurse practitioners, physicians do rounds uh, every day. Um, and so there's two uh, 
two reasons to go to the, to the care center, um, the inpatient care center. And one is respite care. So if you're a caregiver and you're taking care of somebody who's on hospice and you're, you're exhausted and you need a break, um, you can go to the respite care. And that's covered uh, under your insurance for, um, I think it's what, five right. days? Five, five days of respite care. Um, and so it's just nice. You can come in and, and you can just spend time with your loved one and not be the primary caregiver. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, someone just needs a little extra. They may be having a little more pain. They may be having a little bit more anxiety. They come into the, the inpatient care center. They might just be tweaking the medications and watching them more closely to where they can get more comfortable. The other one um, is that someone needs to be inpatient. So it could be that they're having really severe symptoms that cannot be managed at home or in the <coughs> nursing home. And so they will come in, and that is, there's no time limit on that. Um, that is just uh, uh, lots of one-on-one -on -one care with an RN, the physician or the nurse practitioner seeing that patient daily, uh, really focusing on that symptom management. So that could be really severe shortness of breath, it could be severe pain, um, nausea and vomiting that's intractable, meaning it won't stop. Uh, so those types of things that, that they, can, they can care for the individual. And that's an option for a high le higher level of care for our patients um, and not having them go to the hospital. So many mm -hmm. patients get to that point where they don't want to go to the hospital. Our inpatient care center is very similar to a hospital. It just doesn't look like that. You're mm -hmm. going to get the doctor care and you're going to get the nursing care, um, but it's a more, much more home-like environment. And it's only eight beds, so it's, it's very intimate, it's very small, and you can visit your loved one while you're there as well. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, my mom went into hospice and she chose to go home. What's the criteria to go in house versus home? Oh, she chose to to go. Yeah, yeah. she said I want to go home. Could she have left the hospital and come to you, or is there criteria that she had to be worse than what she was? I'm gonna understand your question. I'm sorry. She was put on hospice mm -hmm. and she chose to go home. Mm -hmm. Could she have come to you guys instead? Or Depending is there a criteria? Uh, definitely. So talking about the acute care, so how the, the extended level of care. And so unfortunately, I, I hate saying it this way, but insurance dictates a lot of that. And so uh, the acuity of her level of care. If she wanted to go into that facility, they would look at the acuity, uh, the needs that she had. If she required that one-on-one -on -one nursing, um, and then seeing a, a provider every single day. So I don't know if, if many of you remember back in the day, several, several years ago, the inpatient care center was a place that you could actually go and live. Um, and it's no longer that way anymore. Mm -hmm. What it is is an actual inpatient care center that is dictated by insurance for patients who have severe symptoms that need to be managed by a physician, by a nurse what do you every day. you severe when they're dying? Uh, like Anastasia was saying, so someone who has un uh, shortness of breath and we cannot get it under control with medications either in their home um, or if they have severe pain that's not being able to be managed with the medications at home, we bring those type of patients into our care center to have a physician and a nurse see them. They're available 24 hours a day. There's a nurse and a doctor at that facility to be able to make sure that we can get those symptoms under control and get them... Not, maybe not pain-free, but very more comfortable than they were at home or the facility. Um, a lot of people think that these, these assisted living facilities have nurses in them. They don't. They have med techs, they have CNAs, but they do not have the nursing care that that patient may need. So a lot of times they may come from assisted living and be managed in our inpatient care center. Now once we get them stable and get them much more comfortable, we can to either send them back home to their environment that they were or send them back to their facility wherever they were prior to that. Um, but I can, I can say honestly, I think if a patient is going to be passing in the, you know, maybe a week or two, that's probably what the inpatient care center is going to manage, um, not a patient who's going to pass in the next six months. Does that give you a little bit better understanding? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so I know that, okay, yes. Whenever uh, mom went to respite care, she made it 
three days, and we was in the process of finding her a place to go when she passed away. Mm -hmm. Because hit on the cost at the respite if they stay there per day. I mean, it, it was pretty, uh, uh, it, it was pretty good price. Mm -hmm. You might tell the folks what that is. Um, yeah, if you're not meeting the criteria of being inpatient in our inpatient care center, which means that your insurance is going to cover that, then it does become a private pay. Um, and it's just very similar. It's a lot less than the hospital setting, but it is costly because you're paying to have a doctor that's there throughout the day and you're paying for an RN, um, not an LPN. You're paying for that type of level of, of care and service that, that you may need, like a hospital setting. So it, it does become costly. We do try to discharge patients either back to their prior level of care or being able to find placement. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times, sometimes these nursing homes are full. Well, placement was cheaper than your than yes. the hospital. Oh, yes. Can you fill a number out? Uh, it, I think it depends. Um, it was seven there, or eight hundred dollars a day, I thought, or, my, yeah. or maybe more. No, I no, no, I don't think it's more than that. I want to say, it, it, I'm, I, since I'm not hospice, I don't want to. I don't want to say anything. Mm -hmm. You know. But again, like, like Justine was saying, that's because the insurance would not cover it. Right. That's why right. it goes back to the patient. Right. 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 And so the level of care that she was receiving in the respite care versus going to a nursing home. A nursing home, they don't have RNs and a physician there 24/7. They have uh, medical med techs, mm -hmm. um, and so they're not being seen. You know, someone coming in every 30 minutes, 15 minutes, every 10 minutes. You know, as you know. Right. As, as, so. It's a level of care that you were paying for, and I'm, I'm sorry that you had that experience, you know. Um, yeah. well, you know, Mom did have no uh, quality of life there at the end, so uh, she said to me, I'm ready to go. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mom, I'm ready for you to go, too, because mm -hmm. I hate to see you like this. Mm -hmm. But that, yeah. was, that was the way we, uh, that's, uh, that was our experience. Mm -hmm. She had no quality for the last two months maybe in bed all the time. Mm -hmm. How long was she at the inpatient care center? Three, Three days. days. Okay. And she went there initially on respite? On respite, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, ma'am. No, I was just answering the question. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's my husband. Hi, husband. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. But Justine, um, maybe to yes. help people get their mind around it, generally speaking, um, Medicare covers hospice cost, is that correct? Correct. So just appreciate that, that for a lot of folks that are, are requiring hospice care, it is covered if the Medicare or most insurances. Yes, Medicare covers that. It is, it is a benefit uh, as part of your Medicare insurance. Medicaid also covers um, hospice care as well as most commercial insurances. Um, we, have, uh, we may have to call them to do a carve out as, as a piece of the insurance, but um, Typically, that, that's usually never an issue. Yeah, when you guys were coming to our house, uh, I, I don't remember paying out anything. Right. Uh, that's that's covered, covered, covered by your by Medicare. Medicare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was all covered when yes. you guys yeah. were coming to the house. Mm -hmm. Yes, they cover all parts of that. The only thing the insurance doesn't cover, they don't believe in the music therapy. They don't believe in the pet uh -huh. therapy, those uh -huh. type of services. We yes. as hospice agency believe how... What a great opportunity yeah. music therapy is for our patients and what they do. It's not just someone sitting at bedside with a boom box. It's actual therapeutic um, means. And if you haven't experienced that, I, I highly recommend you to do that as well. But um, insurance doesn't cover that. So again, we utilize our fundraising efforts that happen throughout the community throughout the year, as well as our um, thrift stores to help um, pay for our music therapist um, to be able to see patients. I know this isn't on you because you just explained insurance, um, but uh, you know we know Steve and Kim's situation. She she passed, but yet Medicare didn't see that as necessary to be there. Correct. She was there, but I know she was, she was there, but Medicare didn't see the necessity morning. to pay. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know the situation. Like I yeah. said, I'm not a I'm not yeah. a hospice nurse practitioner or palliative care yeah. and I can look into this and figure out what had happened and talk to talk to our medical director um, because if you get five days of respite care and she was only there for three days and I don't understand she was there the fifth day well, okay 
She died on the fifth day. No, Kim. <laughs> well, somewhere between three and five. Right, okay. <laughs> three and five. But I don't understand the fifth, why the that fifth was day would have been Sunday, Kim. Yes, the fifth day would have been Sunday. Yeah. That's, just That's when she died. No, she. But I used to work for insurance companies moons ago, and I had to I go to tell a family. Phone. Member it don't that matter. That was in the hospital, be. let's just say, for congestive heart failure. And we know insurance well enough. Okay, you get five days in there. And they were in there on the sixth day, so that last day wasn't medically necessary. Mm -hmm. And I was just a kid. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wait a minute, that makes no sense to me. They died in the hospital, but I got to go tell them it wasn't medically necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you tell them. it's kind of the same thing. I'm not friends with the insurance company. I know. <laughs> I know. I don't do it anymore. I've done it for years and years, but yes. So under private insurance, you know, a lot of what I've dealt with in the past has been people under Medicare. But um, but using private insurance, isn't it typically hospice care subject to co-pays and deductibles? And stuff yes, like through, okay. through so they, private insurance. They may not necessarily pay 100%. Correct. Okay. Correct. I, that's what I thought. Yes. I it, every insurance is different depending on what that hospice benefit is or even if they don't have a hospice benefit we'll have to create one because um, a lot of times that's people who are working um, age and that's the type of insurance that they have so they will do a carve out to be able to do the hospice care for that particular patient and they're all different believe me before I did this job I did insurance care with um, rehabilitation and they are not my friends. <laughs> I felt more of an advocate for patients than um, than probably working for the rehab that I did. So, yeah. And not all hospices have the same programs that Blue Ridge does. Correct. Correct. Blue Ridge is nonprofit. Some hospices are for profit. So we're fortunate in this area, geographic area, to have Blue Ridge hospices. <coughs> And we have um, a more robust programming than other hospices in the area. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. We need to have uh, Brenda Horner here with I us. Know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> She's our billing department. <laughs> um, so the Dr. Flynn's slides talks about when should I at, when should I ask about hospice care, and I think a lot of times your primary care provider may be uncomfortable with broaching that subject, and and I know even as a palliative care provider, sometimes I am uncomfortable broaching that subject. It's a very uncomfortable subject to go, okay, we've had we've exhausted treatment, we've exhausted therapy, we're at a point where let's talk about comfort and, and, and quality of life versus quantity of life and aggressive treatment. And so, you know, a lot of education needs to be given to primary care in that area to, to have open discussions. And a lot of times families will feel relief once that, is bro that subject is broached. It's almost like an unspoken, oh, this is uncomfortable conversation. But once it's started, you know, you start having that conversation, the families can start um, grappling with some of those issues and be, being a lot more comfortable with, with that discussion. Um, you know, studies show that when that is broached, that conversation is broached by your primary care provider, that families just get a sense of peace and relief. They have more patient satisfaction and, and, and known better quality of life. Our largest complaint that we get at hospice is that I wish I would have known about you sooner because once they start the hospice services and having the people come out and being able to take care of not only the patient, we take care of the family as well. That is our number one complaint. How, why didn't I know about this? Why didn't my doctor talk to me about this? Well, I look at it as physicians are trained to treat and care and cure. Um, when they have to uh, have the conversation about hospice, they feel like you know maybe they haven't done everything that they need to do. And I know oncology, that's, that's a tough area as well. Um, your oncologists struggle with that. Um, so it, it's, once they start receiving those services, they feel that huge relief um, mm -hmm. and being able to have people that help come in and support them. We're not there 24 hours a day, but our team members that come in and out. I mean, you have a physician, you have a nurse, you have a CNA, <coughs> you have a social worker. I mean, there's a whole team that comes in throughout the week to make sure that the needs are being met for the patient and the family. 
Um, some people ask, you know, what if hospice isn't for me? You start hospice and you're like, this is not what I want. This is not the direction I want to go. You can discontinue hospice anytime. You don't have to, you, once you sign that, you're not forever in hospice. You can say, you know what, I want to go back to aggressive treatment or curative treatment. You can come off hospice anytime. Um, and so that's something that I think is another myth. Once you're in hospice, you can never leave hospice. And that, that is not the truth. Um, and then, can I be discharged from hospice? And we do. We do have some patients. They're declining and declining and declining, and they get put on hospice, and all of a sudden they just almost get like this rejuvenation and, and uh, improved energy and, and health. And so we're like, you're doing so well, you don't need to be on hospice anymore. So we recommend being discharged from hospice. Um, and so that, it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. I notice it <clears throat> mostly in my nursing home patients with very end-stage dementia that uh, they're put on hospice and they get that extra level of care with hospice, that extra love, that extra treatment and they just get rebolstered and energized and doing so much better that they get discharged from hospice. And we're not curing anything, but we are treating symptoms and mm -hmm. making that patient feel better. Sometimes they may need to come back on services within a week, three months, um, but we, we wait for that decline to start happening again before hospice insurance-wise can pick them back up and be able to continue to treat. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk about dementia? Because we've got some people here that are very, that have interest in the dementia side. Mm -hmm. um, dementia care. Well, I think that they were under the impression that hospice didn't really address that. And you, since you opened it up, would you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, um, dementia is, is a progressive <coughs> disease. Um, and it's not always linear. Uh, and there's different types of dementia. So you can have Alzheimer's disease, which seems to have a little bit more of a linear progression. Um, there's vascular dementia. Um, there's dementia caused by um, alcoholism. Uh, so there's different types of dementia. And then even within the Alzheimer's uh, arena, there's more aggressive types. Uh, one could be under that category of like Lewy body dementia. Um, Parkinson's disease, some individuals get dementia with uh, late Parkinsonian um, diagnosis. So um, you're, the best way I can describe it is that you are on the train, mm -hmm. the dementia train, and the, there's no getting off of that train. You're on that train, um, and you're going to continue to decline. Generally, when someone gets on hospice for dementia, is that they are no longer to, able to do things that they were once able to do. Not being confused and knowing how to um, eat, or um, I guess that would be one reason to be, we, what we do, let me back up, we look at different um, scales. So we look at the ability to do things, and how much are they in bed. <laughs> are they in bed all the time? They're not able to get out of bed. Because of the dementia, they can no longer walk, talk, feed themselves, do anything, and they're just complete total care. Uh, they're losing weight. Uh, they're starting to get more bed sores because they're, those are the, that's when we start looking at hospice um, a little bit before that time. So when they're not eating anymore, really, they're really struggling to for any type of care, we'll start looking at hospice to start comfort care and uh, improving the quality of life. And again, with hospice coming in, the nurses, that nursing education is just wonderful. So it gives caregiver education, it gives nursing education on how to care for your loved one, helps to prevent those bed sores from developing. Um, so that's, that's kind of how hospice is involved with dementia, but we don't have anything like specific dementia care. Yes. And, and you, look at, you look at hospice as, it's a, we are treating and supporting a life-limiting illness. Mm -hmm. So that covers a vast amount of diagnoses. Um, in every admission that comes into hospice, a decision from a physician is, is made before anyone is admitted. Every single patient is reviewed by a nurse, and the doctor gets the sign off to say, yes, this patient is appropriate for hospice um, before we even start care. Yes, sir? Um. You need to talk a little bit about what your uh, 
with the dementia care because not every patient is the same. But that's fine. Uh, my mother has everything that you mentioned except mobility. Her feet hit the floor at 4 o'clock in the morning and she's 90 mile an hour until 8 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And then she sleeps three or four hours, and then it's all over again, mm -hmm. and to the point that we just can't deal with it. You're exhausted. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any help at all. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're in West Virginia, and I'm in Virginia, and it's 520 miles round trip for me to go spend mm -hmm. uh, several days. Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm -hmm. You're right, and so there, that's what I, my point I was trying to make is that there's just not one specific type of dementia. There's, there's multiple uh, causes for dementia. Um, and so, yes, yeah, sometimes the mind is gone and not able to communicate, but the body is still going uh, quite a bit. And, uh, and, but eventually, the brain's ability to communicate with movement, walking, uh, feeding yourself, um, even the brain's ability to communicate beating the heart or digesting, um, it's, it's almost like a slowly, but surely the, the main functions that we do, um, you know, we have voluntary and involuntary abilities to do stuff. So voluntary is I tie my shoe, I get in my car, my drive. Involuntary is my heart beating every day, my brain thinking through processes, <coughs> breathing, digesting. Um, all those things are involuntary. And the brain talks to everything for that. And as dementia progresses, the brain, the body's ability to listen to what the brain is saying, or the brain's inability to talk to the body, that's when the heart may stop, or the difficulty breathing, or stopping digesting, not able to digest effectively, um, those, those types of things. So right now, it sounds like with your mother, um, she's not remembering you, she's have a, had a lot of memory loss, but her body's still communicating where, her brain is still communicating, hey, I can get up and run, I can go, I can do these types of things. So it's not a typical progression. The only one I would say is typical progression would be Alzheimer's disease. So if we could, I just want to make sure that the group understands. Um, you, you just can't pick up the phone and call hospice and say, hey, we're ready for you, right? It has to come yeah. through a medical professional. No. Oh, is that right? Anyone can make a referral to hospice. Okay. Well, generally, Anyone. my experience has been, mm -hmm. yeah. and I can give you five solid examples, not publicly, <laughs> where they were turned down, so we had to advocate through the primary care physician to get them in. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure that people understand, sometimes you have to be <coughs> an advocate for oh, the person absolutely. you're caring for, mm -hmm. because as Anastasia says, and I hope you didn't miss it, some medical professionals, they just can't broach the subject. They choose not to. They're too busy. Maybe they don't know how to do it with you. And if you're not advocating for them, um, who is going to? Right? Or at so, least starting the conversation, at least asking the question. But anyone can make a referral. The neighbor can make a referral. Anyone can make a referral to hospice. And, and what we do with that is our intake and admissions team takes down as much information as we possibly can. We also then ask who your physician is to gather as much information medically about your loved one or patient so that we can get a better understanding of whether or not they meet the criteria for hospice. So the more information we have, if they've been hospitalized, if they've been to the ER, all that documentation um, helps us make a better under determination of whether patients are appropriate for hospice. And that basically means having insurance pay for that care. Okay, so now we're gonna switch over to palliative care, which I'm a lot more comfortable with than I've been doing. Um, go ahead. Um, how about after you've lost a loved one? Grief counseling? Would that be now or palliative? I didn't want to No, no, me. that is hospice, okay. definitely. Okay. And so we have a fantastic bereavement team, uh, 13 months, mm -hmm. 13 months of bereavement. Um, Does anybody know why we would cover 13 months? That first year. That first year. First. first of everything, your first birthday, the first anniversary, the first holiday. Um, and we cover that with our team of um, counselors and therapists to be able to make it a little less difficult um, in that process. 
Uh, and it is as much involvement as you want. Um, if you want additional counseling, our counselors are available to do that. We have support groups across the area for you to be able to join um, and have those conversations and not feel it, that you're alone. Um, because everyone, and, and we had talked a little bit about anticipatory grief. Um, your loved one may not have passed away yet. Boy, do you feel that and you think about, well, when they do. Um, so our counseling team is fantastic at being able to um, help you process your grief. So would I just call the office and see when that is? The support groups? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I can give you a number at the end. Okay. Absolutely. Good. Good. <coughs> I, I, um, do you have to have, the, the patient, do they have to have been in hospice in order to receive the grief counseling? Okay. No, ma'am. Um, we our, our grief and loss um, support team supports our area that we serve. So we serve all the way from Page County, down the 81 corridor, Shenandoah, Warren, Winchester, Frederick, Clark, and all of Loudoun County. So if it's an area that we serve, our grief and loss team can be available to the community. We've done <clears throat> several things of, at schools where there's been a traumatic um, incident that a student has been lost. Um, especially during COVID, we had an increased rate of suicides in the school systems. Um, and our team would go out and be able to support the school, the students, um, and help process what has just happened. So we are available as long as it's in the service area that we have, we can support, and you do not have to have a loved one on hospice. Great question. Uh, but can you have just one-on-one -on -one counseling or group? Uh, most of the time it's group. Um, they may do a few sessions of one-on-one. -on -one. It really is very individualized. They do an assessment based on what they feel your needs would be. Sometimes they then make the recommendation to a community provider. So they will initially see you and have those conversations, but if they feel that you need a lengthy amount of treatment um, for counseling sessions, they will probably refer you to someone in the community. But they have lots of resources they can Oh, use. absolutely. Yeah, that kind of help people recognize, okay, this is normal, this yes. is what to expect, these are the stages of grief, and that sort of thing. Absolutely, yeah. yes. yes are, there, um, are there churches that support what you're offering, the bereavement, or the grief? So our, count, our, our um, group sessions tend to happen in the community. Um, they're not at any specific church. Um, I mean, we are non-denominational. We include so we. all. Yes. So <laughs> it, it's, it, 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 there's not really a, a particular church that we work with. It's just depending on where they're going to be hosted. So, um, and like I said, we have them throughout the whole area. And I will actually go out to my car and bring you guys in. The list of support groups so you all have that yeah so if we wanted to get something together we could, how would we do that so we had talked about um, I had talked with Stacy about um, having one of our <laughs> members in their counseling or therapist come out and have the conversation of either a particular topic if it's anticipatory grief we can do that if it's um, grief and loss that you've all lost a loved one we can do that so I think we're kind of open to maybe another session with our treatment team um, to have either a, a counselor or even a chaplain come out and have those conversations. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ladies, just a comment, and we spent a good amount of time on the patient itself, but I just want to reflect <laughs> briefly. I, I lost my mom seven years ago. I lost my dad 16 years ago, and both I had the experience, if you will, of having Blue Ridge Hospice be part of that process. And it was hard for me to compartmentalize. Kim will tell you, for many years, I was a pre-hospital care provider. I was a paramedic, and I was always trained to treat the patient. Yeah. You all brought to life a book called On a Journey, I believe it was. And I sat and read that book and it made so much sense. It put, it put things in perspective, if you will. You know, in realization and that the patient literally is on a journey mm -hmm. and that we have to share that journey with them. Mm -hmm. 
and can't tell you how helpful that was. I'm good. I'm very glad to hear that. Um, and especially being a paramedic, because you've had to do a lot. You see loss every day. And, and you've had to put that in a different section. And I did it, you know, I did it volunteer-wise. Mm -hmm. But, you know, come to the realization of what that journey in included, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, I, I just can't say enough. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll have to check out that book, and I want to share another book that someone had offered before my mom was even at that stage, Being Mortal, mm -hmm. and it touches on you guys, mm -hmm. and um, I, I'm just preaching that book because I say everybody should read it. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're a hospice age or, or, or hospice or not, mm -hmm. it's just living, and that doc, it's written by a doctor whose parents were doctors, but, and we had the unfortunate, in my opinion, situation where, like he wrote in his book, doctors are trained to treat it, mm -hmm. or treat the patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, the, the children, didn't want to speak of the <coughs> mom. We were ready to say, where are we? Where, what does this walk look like? Where they just kept treating and kept treating and kept treating. And mom had the utmost faith in her medical team mm -hmm. until her body was just, and, and mom looked at him and said, why didn't you tell me sooner? Mm -hmm. When it finally happened, mm -hmm. and she, she really liked this one guy, and he, said, he came in the next morning and said, I understand you've accepted hospice care. And she said, yeah. And then he went, thank God. And that's when she went, why didn't someone tell me sooner? It's and very hard uh, for them yeah. to have he this said, conversation. He said, well, we just want to give you, you know, the like care that you want. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but my poor mom trusted you. That's what I wanted to say, but I didn't. Um, she trusted you guys, and you gave her hope mm -hmm. because you never mentioned the alternative. Mm -hmm. You never mentioned what was next. That so, happens every single day, which makes my job very difficult. Yeah. Because my job Absolutely. is to educate the physicians in our community as to what hospice is yeah. and why it's so important. Yeah. Hospice isn't there to take care of you the last three days of your life. Yes, we will do that, but you have missed yeah. so much of what we are able to help provide you as a patient and your family. And this book gives a lot of cases where people did go to hospice and then had a better quality life mm -hmm. because of, so if anybody wants to read it, you really, it's I a think very everybody good book. should. It's a very good book. Yeah. Every and hospice patient. patients, a lot of people don't understand and realize this, but hospice patients live 29 days longer than if they hadn't had hospice. Um, we want to be able to be in there with that patient and with the family six months. Um, and like Anastasia said, we've had patients on for over a year. I've seen patients on for four years because CHF patients do this. We do really good and then we bottom out. And then we do really good and we bottom out. Mm -hmm. We will be there as long as there continues to be a decline. Um, but we want to be involved in that patient's life so that they have a much better quality of life for a longer period of time mm -hmm. than just the last three days or the last, you know. All, week. all hospice care is not created equal. You are absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. We are indeed blessed to have Dr. Flynn. He's, he's an amazing. Amazing we are very lucky, You're very blessed, yes. Well, you're, what you just said is a perfect segue to uh, palliative care because majority of my patients, so if I, could, if, I could, if I could write a graph of a continuum, illness to death, um, a lot of times we're getting hospice right here and then there's death. So if we're getting palliative care back here when we're still doing aggressive curative treatment, as a palliative care provider, I am in communication with the patient, the family, and all the providers. I send all my notes, I call the physicians, and so we start having that open communication way back here. It improves quality of life, definitely. It opens that communication early on. Um, it definitely, I can communicate with, with the providers and the specialists. These are the symptoms that the patient is experiencing with cancer treatment or with congestive heart failure treatment or with COPD treatment and I make recommendations based on those findings. Um, um, so 
back to a lot of the oncology patients that I have. The oncologists want to keep trying, want to keep trying, they want to keep trying. And the patient is so symptomatic and so un un unhappy. And so they're believing that the oncologist has the best in mind because the oncologist says, I don't want to quit, let's keep going. <coughs> So being able to, uh, Dr. Hauk is giving a lot more referrals now, and it's great because I can communicate with him and just let him know that, hey, the patient is really not doing well with the treatment. I think maybe we need to start talking about transitioning, stopping treatment and transitioning. And so I think um, the oncologist and the cardiologist really appreciate having that open communication and going, okay, just like you said, ah, finally, you know. So, um, so does the patient, are they the one that has to do that, to request um, care, or are so they going to ask certain questions, and hopefully these doctors are going to go, oh, maybe we need to. And what's it, that's, it's great that you're mentioning that, because now that you know we've been around, palliative care has been around for an, a year now for, 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 for Blue Ridge, um, a lot of the specialists are getting um, word that, that we're here. And so I'm getting a lot of referrals from Dr. Hauk. I'm getting a lot of referrals from the neurologist um, for Parkinsonian type diseases and other neurological diseases. Cardiology, I'm getting a lot of referrals now. So I think it's just word of mouth and, and patient satisfaction, you know, um, that they're going back and, and saying, oh my gosh, you know, we love Anastasia, we love Dr. Flynn, this is what's going on. And, and so they're getting that good positive feedback. They, the providers love that I communicate with them, that I'm always reaching out to them and talking to them, either via phone call or email, text message, or just sending my notes. And so so are they possibly still having treatment? Yes, with palliative care, you are still getting aggressive treatment. You're still getting chemotherapy if you have cancer. You're still getting, you know, you may be having a pacemaker placed, or you may be having uh, a, a cabbage done, or you know, aggressive treatment, uh, lung surgery, um, all those types of things. With palliative care, you're still getting aggressive curative treatment. And that's a good way to separate the two. Mm -hmm. Palliative care, you're still seeking aggressive treatment for your diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Hospice, you've kind of come to terms that I want comfort measures only. Mm -hmm. So that's if you look at that, it's an easy explanation between the two. Mm -hmm. And so in your mother's case, when they just kept treating and treating, sometimes having someone in between, being able to see the patient in their home, I come to your home, I see, your, I see the home setting, I see the patient, and I, and I know a lot of times the patient, when they get to the doctor's office, they put on this, they're, they're together, they're well dressed, they're holding it all in, they see their doctor and everything looks like everything's going good. As soon as they get in the car, they start falling apart. They get home and they're a mess. And so when I come into their home, I see, I see the true patient. I see where they're at in the process of, of this disease and the management and what the chemotherapy is doing or what the surgeries are doing and being able to communicate that to. Yeah, we went from, uh, I think you need a, to talk with palliative care. So mm -hmm. we're like, okay, my sister and I look at each other. We know what's happening. And then a gentleman came in. It was really a tough conversation. I felt like for him mm -hmm. and my mom. Mm -hmm. And then we went right to hospice mm -hmm. in the same day. Mm -hmm. yep. So we completely skipped out of the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Because so, of our ignorance. Well, not your ignorance. I mean, you, 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 there's always hope. And then, and then there's encouragement from the providers. So you, you're doing, you know, we don't get to retry this many, many, many times. So when we're on this train, it's the first time, and we don't have any background <laughs> to, to be able to fall, fall back on. But again, talking about that continuum of care, you know, if we get back here, maybe the diagnosis with cancer, we're way back here, and we start palliative care. So we're seeing that we're following you all along to that disease process. And that whole transition is so much more smoother. You're having those open communications and you're dealing with symptom management. Yeah. And you can kind of look at it. How, often, how long are you all in the doctor's office seeing the doctor? 10, 15. You got it. Yep. You got it. And, and I think they're even trying to lessen that now <laughs> um, to see more patients. Mm -hmm. 
and during I'm, the day because I'm, I'm with you for an hour. So I come in and I'm with you for a full hour. Right. Yeah. So I will spread the word. <laughs> <laughs> Get your phone ready. Yeah. Yeah. So what does palliative care do? So again, symptom management. So a lot of times when you're receiving <coughs> aggressive treatment, I know I've kind of said the same things over and over again, but um, when you're doing aggressive treatment, there's generally a lot of symptoms associated with that. So um, palliative care came about with oncology. Um, and so what happened was the physicians uh, were trying to treat the cancer and the patients were coming in with all these other symptoms. It could be anxiety, depression, pain, nausea, shortness of breath, fatigue. And the oncologists simply did not have time to deal with all this. They just want to say, okay, this is what your lab's doing. This is what we need to do. There's your treatment. And so palliative care came about to be able to help these patients with their symptoms in a setting of cancer. And, um, and so symptom management improves quality of life. So mm -hmm. it can improve while you're doing aggressive treatment, help you keep going if you need to. But also palliative care can watch the trends and say, we're at the point now where there's no good return on what we're doing. It's time to talk about transitioning to hospice. So, um, so focus on, on symptom management is really a big part of what I do with palliative care. Any questions about that so far? And the difference between Anastasia being a palliative care um, practitioner and your doctor is, this is what Anastasia does every day, all day long. She's an expert at um, terminal illnesses. Um, she manages that and does that every day. Your primary care physician covers a whole other gamut of, of diagnoses. So they trust that, that's why they love the communication so much with Anastasia, because she's giving the real thing that's happening at the home with the patient, not just the 10 minutes that you see them in the office. Well, my question is this. Uh, what I'm hearing is that you're only dealing with uh, terminal illnesses like cancer and uh, some other related things. Uh, I'm not hearing anything about Alzheimer's or dementia. Is that right? Nope, I have probably, I would say, probably about 70% of my population has dementia. Mm -hmm. Yep. But do they have other things? They do have other things with them as well. Um, some of them, let me think. Well, majority of them uh, have, they could have hypertension, uh, some basic thing that majority of the population already has. Um, diabetes, hypertension, um, maybe some kidney <coughs> issues. But the main focus is that they have dementia, Alzheimer's disease, or vascular dementia. A life-limiting illness. Mm -hmm. That's how you kind of want to look at it. If it is um, prohibiting them from living a normal, everyday life, <coughs> and the symptoms are continuing to increase, and the patient is continuing to decline, that's where anesthesia and palliative care can come in to help manage those symptoms. And to give a plug for Anastasia, she was a primary care physician before she did this, so she has an even broader experience with all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, that my background is family practice before going into palliative care medicine. Mm -hmm. So um, I know dementia is one of those really. My father died from uh, a very aggressive Lewy body dementia at a very young age, and so I have an appreciation for the difficulty of that um, and symptom management is very difficult as well but with dementia um, for some reason pain becomes an issue they don't know why why it's happening but pain is an issue um, falls lots of falls uh, difficulty eating so weight loss um, agitation so a lot of mental behavioral disturbances agitation um, depression, anxiety. So dementia is really just a, a very um, difficult disease process. Yes? So because we're so close to the West Virginia line here, um, how do you handle or are you able to assist people that have perhaps their family member is in West Virginia versus Virginia? 
We are only licensed um, by our Joint Commission in Virginia. Okay. Uh, but I do hear that at least three times a week when I'm out and about that they need more supportive services in West Virginia. Um, currently, you know, I think it's the Panhandle, uh, Hospice Panhandle. Is hospice that what you guys have? Um, and I'm not aware. I don't know if they have palliative care. I I'm not sure. Um, but I think that's your only, is that the only hospice in West Virginia currently? No. There's other options? Uh, the one that we tried to use was out of Charleston. They took out care of South Central West Virginia. Okay. But they, you would have gotten more out of them by doing it yourself. And that's mm -hmm. what we finally had to end up doing. I'm so sorry to hear that. Because they literally said to my sister, who is the main caregiver, and I'm just the relief pitcher, is uh, uh, she's not dying fast enough and we're not going to help you. And that was three years ago. So that was the hospice, not the palliative care, is that That's right? correct. Okay, okay. We yeah. were just, well, irate, but what do you do about it? Mm -hmm. Yep. And like I said at the beginning, uh, before I started the palliative section, is that it is, a, it is a newer medicine. It's probably only about 50 years old, and so it is so needed in every community, but it's, it's slow growth and progression. And right now, um, I don't want to get too off track, but, the, but palliative care right now is kind of the Wild West. There's really no, uh, insurance doesn't say palliative care has to do this. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's developing. Um, it sounds like a step in the right direction. It is a step in the right direction. It is. And so some palliative care, you know, you may get closer to the D.C. area. And that, that, I'm glad that this is a good segue to this as well. So you may have some palliative care that are in the city area. They have a full, robust team. Um, here, since we're just starting out our palliative care program, we have myself, Dr. Flynn, and we have a social worker now. So we don't have nurses. We don't have aides. We don't have music therapists. We don't have counselors. Um, we don't have a big, robust team right now. Um, so saying that we're hoping to grow in that direction, and I, and I have no doubt we will grow in that direction. But, um, but I think just starting that first step of getting that going. In the community, there's been such a need, and, I, and you know referrals coming in. I'm probably getting, each month, I'm probably easily getting 20 referrals a month now. Uh, it's just come flying in. There's such a great need. Um, and so for our team is, is gonna have to grow out of, out of necessity. Um, and so saying that, smaller communities, I don't know where your mom lives in, in West Virginia, but small communities are not even reaching, you know, mm -hmm. starting this of having a palliative care. Um, so, but I think as it, as it continues to grow and, the, and, and, and it becomes more regulated, uh, right now insurance is not really touching it at all. Um, we're considered a consultation service, and so there is a copay for my visits. Um, it, it's going to slowly develop and, and it's going to be covered because there is showing that palliative care can reduce hospitalizations. And so a lot of times the family is like, our goal is to stay out of the hospital because every time my mom goes in the hospital, she comes back out again, she's sicker, she's weaker. Um, so if we come in and see the patient on a frequent basis and start seeing trends and make recommendations, you know, they, hey, they need more Lasix or they need oxygen now or they need more wound care uh, those types of things that we can see in the home that they can't see in that 15 minute visit um, is again if you're looking at that continuum of care we're we're helping reduce hospitalizations improve quality of life reduce symptom management having discussions about when to transition to hospice um, that's 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 all that our focus is on and it's only a matter of time before insurance realizes how much money they're saving mm -hmm. utilizing palliative care and keeping patients out of the hospital because mm -hmm. it's expensive mm -hmm. hospitals are expensive and nobody nobody wants to be there mm -hmm. yeah. yes ma'am so people um, like for instance his mother transitioned to Virginia would you would they be eligible oh for yeah, definitely definitely if she lived here yeah. mm -hmm. yes it's just you have to take care of where they are and where we're licensed so we're right. licensed in virginia right, right.
Okay. Uh, any other questions going on? Okay. Um, so I talked about the reduction of hospitalization, improved quality of life. I've said that many, many times because I just want to stress that fact. Whether you're in palliative care or you're in hospice, we're improving quality of life. And that, that needs to be the focus. And not only for the patient themselves, but the, but the caregivers as well. Um, I think that's about it that I have. Um, Anastasia, maybe we can um, help a little bit because I'm... I've experienced both within our family and as a pastor where the medical center has a palliative care team as well. They do. And they do. so just be aware that sometimes that gets a little confusing. Mm -hmm. Confusing. The hospital has palliative care and sometimes they will literally come into the room of the patient with the family if, they're, if they have the authority and they will work with them on devising a strategy to also keep them out of the hospital. So just be aware palliative care is a form of medicine, mm -hmm. and you've heard about a team that Blue Ridge Hospice has, but also Winchester Medical Center. And we work really closely with the palliative care team at Winchester Medical Center yeah, um, because we do have hospice in the hospital, and um, especially when they make, they're they going in, they're only you only have palliative care if you're in the hospital with that mm -hmm. team. Um, and so a lot of times they're making recommendations for the patient to be discharged <coughs> to go home or to a facility with palliative care or with hospice, but that initial conversation, you're right, that does happen at the hospital setting with that team. And I do, I'm in communication with them a lot. So I will say, hey, I have a patient that's on palliative care, she's been admitted to the hospital, can you guys keep a close eye on her? They'll call me, hey, we have a patient that we're discharging, we recommend palliative care. So we're, we're in great communication and I have, you know, I'm able to see, um, you know, what was completed in the palliative care team in the hospital. A lot of times their focus is on goals, you know, what are your goals of care and talking about they may be a full code they're wanting to change to do not resuscitate or talking about post forms, which is a whole other conversation we can have. Um, but yeah, so it's great that we have a good open communication with them. And to, I don't know if you've mentioned the scope, but you have over 800 clients right now in Winchester, Frederick County, Clark County area, is that correct? currently serving on hospice. Mm -hmm. On hospice, um, we're currently serving about 340 okay. um, that are currently on hospice. And like I said, about 48% of that are in facilities. So the other portion of that is in homes. Now, Anastasia, um, her team, we count separate. So you probably mm -hmm. have, what, 70 mm -hmm. patients? Mm -hmm. Right, so I was up to 90, and then we went down to 70, and then we're kind of climbing back up again. So. But think of that number just in Winchester, Frederick, and Clark. 340 patients mm -hmm. and it at any point in time in my memory at Round Hill Church I think we pretty much always had at least one person mm -hmm. affiliated or in the Blue Ridge Hospice program or about to go in mm -hmm. so I mean we have we have a family now and so um, we have just recently grown to we, we Previously, we're only serving Western Loudoun. We had so many facilities ask us to come bring our hospice to their facility for their patients that we built a completely separate team to be able to cover the facilities that are of all of Loudoun <coughs> County. So um, we've had other uh, areas ask us as well to come, so I only see us growing, <coughs> but we will always be proactive in being able to build a team first and then go to that area in order to accept patients. Um, it, one of the things of this organization is that we are so proactive in responding to the community's needs. When people call us and say, could you come to Warrington? That may be a next step. Could you come to Harrisonburg? That may be a next step. Um, we, we try to respond to the community's needs and their outreach to us. Um, and we do have the highest quality scores of any hospice in the entire area that we serve. Um, and our return to hospital rate is 0.02%. And that is the second lowest in the entire state of Virginia. That means that we are doing our job of being able to keep patients where they're at and out of the hospital. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, when you said if when you're in, in the hospital, then they have in palliative team in the hospital, but then if they go home, then do they Okay. Yep. That's the natural progression. Okay. And they would
would let one know that. I mean, I know that now. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, right. <coughs> so all of you should be advocates for yourselves, for your loved ones, for your family and friends. Have those conversations. I know it's difficult and hard, but now you are um, empowered with the knowledge of hospice and palliative care. You know what services are out there. You can at least start a conversation if the family physician doesn't. But how do you have that conversation if the doctor is not having that conversation? You can have the conversation with the doctor. You can bring that right up to him or her. Absolutely. I got a question. Uh, my, my mother, she doesn't have a, a terminal illness right now, right? But she is barely able to move. Uh, it takes 20 minutes to get her in the vehicle, and she's in a lot of pain to get her to a doctor's appointment. She's been in and out of the hospital two or three times here in the past month. She's got an open wound on her elbow that we're trying to get somebody to take care of. We do have a wound specialist appointment this Friday. Mm -hmm. But anyway, would she be eligible for her hospice to come take care of her? Um, so She's probably not. what I would recommend is palliative I, care. Oh, yeah. Palliative care yeah. to come out. Mm -hmm. and, and definitely um, see her and follow along with her and do symptom management. Yep. Especially because of the most recent hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. If you're seeing people that are keep going back to the hospital right. or keep falling or keep um, decreasing weight, those type of things are red flags to you guys to say, hey, we need someone to come in and see her. It's, it's not just working out going to the doctor's office. Right. I'm going to try to get that conversation started with the family. Yep, yeah, so appreciate folks that, that those of you who are taking care of parents or relatives or good friends that are elderly, um, it moves sometimes very dramatically and quickly, you know, so someone is eating Sunday dinner with you and then all of a sudden a week later their health is deteriorated, uh, their kidneys may be shutting down, whatever the case may be, and you have to be the advocate for them because sometimes, again, you've heard both these professionals say to you that um, it doesn't happen because it just it, it gets missed or the, the focus is here and it's not the big picture. And one so, thing for you guys too is that there's a member of the congregation that doesn't is not coming as often or is missing. Um, when their daily routine or their weekly routine starts to change, that's also a red flag as they're not feeling well, they're not doing as well um, for someone to be able to check in with them to see kind of where they're at, especially if they were always a member and they're here every Sunday. Can either one of you ladies speak a little bit more to grief? I know there are several in this room that have had recent losses. Um, and I mean, like the stages of grief, the types of grief, and any little... Well, that's what we talked about being able to have our next session do. Mm -hmm. So when you guys, and I can set this up with Stacy or whoever to be able to start and have our grief counselors come out, and that's exactly what they would do. They would have those conversations and educate you on the stages of grief and loss, um, what normalcy is, and um, give you resources for that. So I want to be able to continue to have uh, an avenue to be able to help either educate you guys as caregivers or even additional members that want to come in and have those conversations. But that is kind of our next step, is to have those uh, that team come in and talk with you guys. Grief has a lot of names and a lot of stages. Yes. Okay, and so uh, uh, some of you have on the other end of that that grief. Some of you at the beginning of that grief. Some of you in the middle of it. And, mm -hmm. and so I think this group ultimately hopes to tackle that. This was a beginning conversation just to make you aware of a mm -hmm. of a great service. I, I have to testify to you that uh, we have a family now at our church who is in the middle of hospice care. It just it doesn't ever fall off my calendar that somebody's not and, and they have Blue Ridge Hospice has always been wonderful to work with um, as a pastor they even though I don't have that authority they're always a listening ear and they pay attention to what I say if I happen to bring something to their attention they circle back around with the family um, you know the level of care I mean sometimes hospice with some of your families they only need to come in once a week, and, and maybe they send somebody by for, for um, uh, hygiene purposes once a week, but it gets elevated as needed, and they're very proactive, and so uh, it, it's, a great, it's a great service to have. We're fortunate in our area to have them. Well, thank you. Yeah. 
And you've been around for over 30 years? 43? 43. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Well, while you all was coming to visit Mom at the house for many months, you all done a wonderful job. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a great thing for us, mm -hmm. uh, for Kim and I and the rest of the family. I'm glad to hear that. The, the whole reason I work here at this organization is because I had my own personal experience. Um, I was blown away by what we were able to do to help support um, my grandfather and his wishes. His wishes were to never go to the hospital again, and I'm not going to a facility, and I'm staying home. And we, as a family, that rotate those hours to go and take care of loved ones um, could not have done it without hospice support. All right. Well, I, have, I, I thank you guys for listening. You you all have been one of the best groups that I have spoken to, oh, being thank interactive you. Thank you. and asking questions. <laughs> she didn't look your direction. Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> Anastasia and I can have these conversations, and there's no conversation. I mean, there's no conversation, there's no conversation. because we also, yeah, we also um, are in facilities educating the staff um, about palliative care and hospice. So sometimes we have these conversations, and it's like crickets. <laughs> so I appreciate you all. You all have asked excellent questions. I have. I'm going to go get the grief support um, support group information. My card's available, um, and I will continue to work with Stacy so that we can get grief support set up for you guys. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.